Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's Aperio microconference. Uh, my name is Clint Lalonde. I use the pronouns he and him, and I'm the director uh, on a board on the board for the Aperio Foundation. Um, if you're not familiar with what the Aperio Foundation is, we're a global nonprofit foundation that advocates and supports the use of open source software in higher education. And our work intersects with various other open movements in higher education, things like open research and open access, open educational practices, and open educational resources, which you're going to hear quite a bit about today. I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, which is colonially uh, known as uh, Victoria. Victoria on Vancouver Island in Canada, uh, which is one of the things I have in common with today's guests. We're both floating around the globe on islands in the Pacific Ocean, though we are on the opposite sides of the world here. Uh, we've got great session today, but before we get into that, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, we offer these micro conference sessions from time to time, focusing on issues of openness in higher education. Uh, if you'd like to be informed of our future micro conferences or keep up with any of the work that's going on with the Aperio Foundation around open source and higher education, you can subscribe to our newsletter at aperio.org or connect with us on LinkedIn and Mastodon, and uh, we will post our, our information in those places as well. We're going to have a Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, the chat is active. Please feel free to introduce yourself. If you are on a traditional territory and you know that, you can enter that information in the chat. We're going to have the chat going for the entire uh, session. I'll be monitoring the chat. And uh, if you have any questions for Wayne, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, and I'll uh, surface any questions that come up during the session. Uh, we're also going to be recording this and posting it on YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel in the coming days. Okay, without further ado, on to today's session and to our guest. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Wayne McIntosh to today's session. Dr. McIntosh is Managing Director of the OER Foundation, headquartered in uh, New Zealand at the New Zealand Institute of Skills and Technology. Wayne holds a UNESCO Chair in OER, Open Educational Resources, and is a committed advocate and user of free software for education. He also has an extensive international uh, uh, experience in educational technology, learning design, and the theory and the practice of open and distance learning. Uh, previously, Wayne was an education specialist uh, for e-learning and ICT policy at the Commonwealth of Learning, an intergovernmental organization located in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, just across the street from where I am today. Uh, before joining Call, he was an associate professor and a founding director of the Center for Flexible and Distance Learning at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, prior to moving to New Zealand, he spent 11 years working at the University of South Africa, a distance learning institution and one of the world's mega universities. Wayne's participated in a range of international consultancies and projects, including work for CAL, the uh, International Monetary Fund, UNESCO, and the World Bank. He is a recipient of the 2019 International Council for Open and Distance Education, uh, Individual Prize of Excellence, and in 2020 was conferred the Open Education Global Leadership Award for significant long-standing contributions to open education. And we're very happy and very fortunate to have him here today posing a, a quite a provocative question. Is open broken? And if so, can education fix it? Reflecting on anomalies in OER. So I'm going to turn it over to Wayne. Oh, thanks very much, Clint, uh, for your kind and extensive introduction. Uh, kia ora koutou. I, I bring you warm uh, greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm based here in Cromwell, in the deep south of the South Island, and it's a beautiful uh, summer's day here, although a tad windy. Um, yes, a, a, a provocative rhetorical question uh, is open broken uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, overseeing the OER Foundation, we've encountered many anomalies, and today I'm just going to reflect on some of those anomalies which have been frustrating uh, me personally for a, a good number of years. But by the same token, you can see that I'm an optimist by nature. I firmly believe that education, uh, not only education as a, a, an institution, a public institution uh, for public good, but also the role that education can play in helping to fix some of the challenges that we are faced with in open. I'd like to thank the invitation from Aperio. I've always had a very high regard 
for a perio uh, just an interesting side connection i met with your former executive director ian dolphin in the early 2000s while leading a, another open source uh, development project and i've been following your work with keen interest so it's really quite a pleasure to be able to speak with an audience that is uh, you know open source friendly i don't uh, have that opportunity too often so without further ado let me get going i work for the ovr foundation it's it's a small non-profit organization we are just two staff but we focused on uh, providing practical support to education institutions and governments with the implementation of the oer recommendation I suppose a good way of um, summarizing our work is we operate at the nexus or the overlap, if you will, between free and open source software and OER, open education practices, open pedagogy, whatever label you want to uh, apply. So let me get uh, this out of the way in the beginning. Uh, I'm sure we will all agree that there's no form of educational delivery that is more cost effective, more scalable, and more sustainable than open education. I thought I'd just plot a very, you know, a brief timeline, and, and, and it's, it's, it's not comprehensive by any means, but a brief timeline of the history of OER. And you'll see right at the top, I have uh, listed the founding of the British Open University. Um, not that the British Open University was the first single mode distance teaching university, but it was certainly the first university to actually use open in its title. And the, the key philosophies of open learning underpinning the work of the open university in removing barriers of access to higher education are quite significant in the history of OER. And sadly, much of the OER research and literature has ignored these foundations and the, you know, the, the work that has been done uh, in removing barriers to education. You will all be familiar with the, uh, the, the beginnings of the free and open source software movement in the 1980s. And that's quite important because you will see later the 4R framework of David Wiley, uh, for the 4R permissions associated with OER are in fact a derivative of the essential freedoms of the free and open source software movement. We had the Cape Town Declaration in 2007. Uh, in 2012, the UNESCO Paris Declaration. Uh, in 2017, the Ljubljana Declaration, all these steps leading to the adoption of the UNESCO OER recommendation in 2019. And a UNESCO re recommendation is actually a pretty big deal because all 193 member states had to agree to the wording of the recommendation as well as its action areas. What is also quite powerful with regards to the OER recommendation, it is what we call a normative instrument in the UNESCO system. And what that means is that governments have a reporting obligation uh, to report back on their implementation of the OER recommendation. For many years, I've advocated that the real challenge we are facing in OER is to cross the chasm from sharing to learn to learning to share. We can all see that releasing educational materials under open licenses is a good thing that will support learning. However, the bigger challenges that we are facing is our inability to share. And this was amplified at the beginning of the onset of the pandemic. I thought that the pandemic was going to be a major land shift, if you will, to the adoption of OER. And I saw very, very little authentic and organic cooperation amongst higher education institutions sharing educational materials in their transition to remote emergency teaching. What we did see, however, were the willingness of institutions to share their recipes 
for migra uh, migrating to uh, remote emergency teaching under an open license, but very real co cooperation was missing. And this shift is in fact a cultural shift. If, you, if, 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 if an open source developer is tackling a new development, the very first thing they will go and do is go and look which applications are, are already available, which libraries have been published that can be reused and remixed in the development of new applications. However, that is a culture we don't see in, uh, among educators. So in terms of anomalies, I'm referring to those things that deviate from what you expect to find. And while I'm uh, moving through some of the anomalies that are frustrating me at this time, I encourage you to share any anomalies you have encountered in your experiences of open uh, in the chat area, because it would be good to have a record of that. The first anomaly is we have many governments reporting actions to support the development of OER policy at both the national and the institutional level. But we see very little evidence uh, of, 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 of this in, in, in the literature in terms of the outputs of what's happening. In the recent consolidated report uh, of the first consultation on the implementation of the UNESCO OER recommendation, we had 60 member states reporting that um, they have initiated actions to support OER policy. However, in a study just oh, a couple of months before the release of the consolidated report by Butcher and Banyath, uh, focusing on the research on the effectiveness of OER, they were only able to uh, find two countries that met the selection criteria for this study. And the selection criteria weren't only onerous. It was really to find the countries that have an OER policy where there was evidence of the government actually approving the policy. Um, some baseline evidence of the activities related to OER prior to uh, the adoption of policy and then published research on the effects of implementation of policy. I've encountered this at our, at our own government when I was assisting them in my capacity as UNESCO chair. I was providing inputs on New Zealand's response to the um, consultation on the OER recommendation. And one of the senior ministry officials uh, had noted to me that they believe that the policy settings for OER in New Zealand were about right. New Zealand doesn't have a national OER policy. My, my response to the policy official was simply this. If our policy settings were about right, one would expect to find the majority of content published under open licenses, which is certainly not the case here in New Zealand. Another real challenge we are faced with is the over-reliance on the majority of OER projects on donor funding. And I would uh, hazard a prediction, unless governments come forward with substantive support, particularly under action area five of the recommendation, which is to nurture sustainable development of OER, OER as an initiative is likely to fail. Interestingly, you, many of you will be familiar with the Bayview Analytics uh, survey, which has a strong focus in North America. While 64% of fac faculty, almost two thirds are aware of OER, we only have reports of 15% using required course materials that are OER, which is an interesting challenge. Another deep concern of mine is the extent of uh, open OER infrastructure that is dependent on proprietary software. And this is a huge challenge for the work that we are doing in the Pacific region, because if we advise a government to adopt technology platform A or B that has proprietary dependencies for OER, it makes it very hard for them to be able to replicate that infrastructure locally. 
This is a big challenge we are facing. Another interesting challenge we, we have, there are you know, you know, about 7,000 spoken languages in the world, but 90% of OER content that is published is published in English. So I guess the question is, how do we fix it? And what I'm going to share with you here are some of the things that we are doing at the OER Foundation to help fix aspects of this challenge as we move into the future and the plans we have uh, for the future. I just reminding folk again, if we go back to the Cape Town Declaration in 2007, there was a very clear statement that open education is not just limited to OER, but it also draws on the open technologies that facilitate collaborative, flexible, collaborative and flexible learning. And so I think we are on the right path. Uh, our, advo our advocacy work and living out the use of free and open source software exclusively is an important part of the mix if we are going to find sustainable solutions. Also informing our new directions at the onset of the, the, uh, the COVID pandemic, we ran a, a, a small support initiative uh, for educators as they were transitioning. And uh, we ran a, a SNAP survey uh, and listed a, a number of uh, things that we could do to help support educators. And based on the responses from over 85 countries, these are the, the, the ranked priorities of folk largely from the developing world in terms of their needs on the ground. Specifically, capacity development for educators in OER, access to open source software tools to be able to do this, and the synchronous conferencing tools to be able to cooperate and work together. Interesting, interesting need access, although ranked high to OER enabled online courses wasn't first on the list. So clearly there is a, a, a need to focus on capacity development and the provisioning of the FOSS tools to enable folk to do this stuff. We do a lot of work in the Pacific region by virtue of being located in the Pacific and amongst a number of our international projects. Um, these are some of the lessons we have learned over the years. Within the Pacific region, large numbers of educators have limited proficiency in digital literacy. Um, so, for example, in one of the surveys we ran in one of the first courses of the Pacific Partnership for Open Distance Learning Initiative, 56% of the teachers reported that they did not have access to a learning management system. And if you are trying to develop skills and improve your digital literacies to, in order to support learning, and you don't have access to the technologies to do it, it's a big challenge. Another big challenge of the Pacific region is the, the, the lack of an, an, uh, you know, digital infrastructure for online living, uh, for, for online delivery. And also the, 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 the problem we have in the Pacific region is this um, donor overload problem. Uh, across the Pacific, you'll find many well-intentioned donors uh, that are pumping money into the Pacific region. And we'll find our ministry officials in the Pacific spending more time trying to deliver on the outcomes of the donor funding at the expense of their own work. And this is a huge challenge in the region. And very often, the, the Pacific Islanders have had very little input into what those outcomes in these donor funded projects should be. So in, ter in terms of moving forward, we are going to be focusing on strengthening the ecosystem here, building digital skills of uh, Pacific peoples in open education practices to utilize OER content, but also at the same time to provision the free and open source software technology that is needed to move forward. And the way that we are planning to do this is through the establishment of a small island developing state platform cooperative 
building on the outstanding work of Open uh, ETC in British Columbia to set up a community garden provisioning a range of free and open source software technologies um, where educators and system administrators can come together through a mentoring initiative to learn and acquire the skills not only of systems administration, but also the design, development, and repurposing of OER. So this is a, 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 a nascent initiative. Uh, we are talking about it in the spirit of releasing early and releasing, uh, well, releasing early. So a little bit about how we're going to put this together. I'm keen to just show you some of the technologies we've been using here within the OER Foundation. But within the OERU, our main technology challenge was to develop an ecosystem, a delivery ecosystem that facilitated cooperative design and development of content, but at the same time, enable institutions to have local branded instances of the content. And in the early days of the OERU, when we surveyed our partners, they were in excess of 10 learning management systems. And so clearly it was not going to be possible for us to select one system and uh, achieve success. So a little bit about the uh, approach we took, uh, we, have deci we decided to uh, select the best of breed of a range of open source, free and open source software technologies, some of, we, of which are listed there on the screen. There are others, but rather than build a new platform, a new solution, we took the proven uh, software applications that have a track record of operating at uh, internet scale and uh, assembled a component-based system. And the power of this is that individual organizations will be able to replicate. Our aim with the Pacific Fossil Initiative is to empower every small island developing state to be able to remix and host their own OER professional development programs and to build digital capacity in systems administration by working together in this shared garden, the Fossil Commons, so that these uh, countries would be able to replicate any one or more of the applications locally. Um, and of course, ensuring quality education and knowledge sharing for all in the region. You would probably have guessed uh, we have a strong commitment to ensure that no learner should be denied access to learning for having to purchase a proprietary software license or even worse, have to sacrifice their freedoms in software choices. And in one of the very first courses in the uh, Pacific Initiative, we assembled a course called Digital Skills for OER Sharing, which was a course to build capacity among educators in the compulsory school sector to uh, create and develop their own OER using free and open source software tools. And this is important because we did not want to uh, in, uh, you know, apply onuses on the ministries of education in these specific island states to have to purchase proprietary software licenses in order to develop skills locally. But at the same time, it would mean that um, the software tools that are loaded on the Ministry of Education's laptops could easily be installed on their own computers at home. And uh, today I want to highlight and profile the work of Annie Teuau, who is a senior lecturer at the Kiribati Teachers College um, and uh, is, is working on uh, providing a practical demonstration that this is in fact possible. I commend Annie's tenacity and commitment to build the digital skills uh, to remix and uh, publish a local version of the Digital Skills for OER sharing course in Kiribati. And just for the benefit of those who are not familiar with Kiribati, uh, it is a, a the, or the, you know, the Republic of Kiribati, it comprises 32 atolls and one raised coral island. 
It's located roughly northeastish in the middle of the Pacific around the equator. Uh, a, a total land area of only 811 square kilometers, but spread over 3.4 million square kilometers. You will see that Kiribati has, uh, has, well, the population of Kiribati is only 121,000, which in fact is smaller than the student populations of some of the single mode distance teaching universities. So you can see the challenges that small island states are facing in the provisioning of technology. And I'll show you examples, some examples of Annie's work. So what I thought I'd do just in a couple of minutes is just to give you a flavor of some of the technologies that we are using to give you a sense of what is possible. Uh, let me go here. So here is a website um, that we set up for the Commonwealth of Learning. It is a Word, WordPress multi-site installation. You'll see that this uh, website is running on the uh, a subdomain of the Commonwealth of Learning. And uh, this website was set up as part of the Pacific Partnership for Open Distance and Flexible Learning, which is building capacity across the Pacific region in the delivery of open and distance learning. Um, and it is uh, with funding support from the New Zealand uh, Foreign Af uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And what this site uh, contains are a number of open courses uh, that learners can uh, enroll for and participate to improve their skills. One of which, of course, is this Digital Skills for OER Sharing Initiative. So if we go, we can go and have a look at that uh, course itself. Um, again, this is a sub-site uh, on the WordPress multi-site where the course materials have been published. Learners can navigate through the course materials um, as you know you do with any well-designed course. But where things start getting interesting is if you go to any one of the pages of the course website, you'll see at the bottom here is a link to, well, there's a content link. And if I'll t I click on that content link, you will see it takes me to a page in media uh, on, on Wiki Educator, which is a media wiki uh, installation. And this gives us the ability to have version control for authors around the world to be able to cooperate and collaborate together on the development of these OER courses. You'll see if I take a look here that essentially the course website is a collection of individual wiki pages um, that have detailed edit history and using the media wikis uh, widget uh, infrastructure uh, authors are able to request a snapshot and behind the scenes we have a series of python scripts um, that are activated and then will take this collection of individual wiki pages and publish them to the WordPress website. And so that's quite powerful. Uh, what I also wanted to show you is, because these courses are available for independent study, uh, we're a small organization, we are you know, only two people. The specific initiative has supported uh, well over 6,000 learners. Uh, an interesting uh, system we have set up. Uh, the course instructions that learners receive, I'll just take you to an example of one of the, or the online version of the course instructions. We have set up an automated email procedure on the back end, which will send out the course instruction emails for the learners. And we do this using a piece of free and open source infrastructure called Mortic. And what you're looking at there is a campaign for managing the distribution of emails. So if a learner registers on the WordPress website and or through an expression of interest on one of the landing pages, they will receive a, a, a welcome email and shortly after an hour instructions for getting started. After a day's time, they will receive the email containing the instructions for session one 
within five days the emails for sessions two and three and so forth and this is how we are able to scale uh, some level of support for the learners engaged in these uh, uh, these online courses. Uh, what I also want to show you is the course feed capabilities. Um, we use a range of technologies, discourse for forums, Mastodon for social media, and other technologies, hypothesis. Uh, we have generated a, a, a handy little a tool here that syndicates interactions that are harvested, if you will, from these uh, distributed technologies. So if somebody posts on the this course website, uh, there will be a sort of a Mastodon-esque uh, timeline of interactions and learners will be able to go to the source of those materials uh, and interact with them on the original website. Um, this, uh, just as a matter of interest, this uh, WordPress infrastructure, the portal uh, can easily be set up. Any individual country could replicate one of these WordPress multi-sites. And for commodity hosting of around about $30 to $40 a month, would be able to have this full infrastructure locally. But the initiative I'm most excited about is uh, the work that is happening in Kiribati. And what I want to show you here is the course that Annie remixed uh, for a local version using the shared fossil infrastructure for uh, at the Teachers Training College in Kiribati. Uh, Annie uh, went and designed uh, uh, the custom branding for her website uh, to mirror the corporate branding of the Ministry of Education website and set up this course. What you would also see, which is quite powerful, is the work that Annie has done in uh, sourcing images of Kiribati learners uh, in these course materials as part of the remix. And this may seem like a trivial exercise, but it is critically import, important for recognitive uh, justice in that Kiribati educators uh, will be able to see themselves in the course materials. And but at the same time, Annie is contributing back to the commons. If you were to go and do a search for images of Kiribati that are published under open licenses, you will see that there are not that many. And so the work that Annie is doing here is really quite powerful and is a practical demonstrator that the notion of the fossil commons is indeed possible um, in this context. So let me just wrap this up here and disclose some of my uh, earlier identity. I have a strong association uh, with the African continent as an African by birth. And many of you will be familiar with uh, this African proverb that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, uh, you go together. So let me wrap it up there. And hopefully we have time for a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Wayne. We, uh, we do have a couple of questions, a little bit of discussion that's coming up in the chat. Uh, uh, I know Billy uh, Mankey has posted a question here about um, the existing government funding that I'm aware of for OER has focused solely on content, but not support for open source systems or standards development, implementation and support. Are there examples of FOSS focused government grants, not only for OER content, but for open infrastructure? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Now, that's not to say they aren't, uh, but I haven't encountered any. It's I'm interesting. Hoping, hey. I'm hoping that we, we might be one of the first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to put another hat I, I have on as well here. I'm uh, the director of open education for an organization here in British Columbia called uh, BC Campus. Uh, and you did mention the open ETC in your presentation, which is near and dear to my heart. And I know there's a few people from the open ed tech collaborative, the open ETC here uh, in the in the session as well. Uh, and, and the organization that I work for BC Campus, BC Campus, we are a government funded organization. We, we have 
have provided some financial support to the Open ETC to do the work that they do, which is very similar to what you're doing with the the Fostel, um, setting up sort of shared systems to help the uh, that are open source to be able to to help in encourage this kind of relationship between open educational resources open pedagogy and open source software and i think you know you talked a little bit at the beginning about the relationship the historical relationship between op oers and open source software and how the work of the open source community in the 80s and 90s and the early days of, of, of technology really influenced a lot of the old, early open educators around going, hey, they're doing this with software. Why can't we do this with resources? And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that relationship. We've got the historical context, but what else do you think that the OER community and the open source community can, can learn and work together uh, from each other about? I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's a quagmire. There there there, there are many complexities. Um, I guess it depends on you know the the values that under are you know underpin your work. I mean, in our case, it's been pretty you know pretty or pretty easy from the perspective we have an unshamed commitment to free and open source software. Um, and part of our work with the the OERU was to demonstrate that it is possible to have a, a delivery system that is entirely based on free and open source software without any dependencies on, uh, you know, proprietary technologies. Uh, it, you know, we've done it, we've supported over a half a million learners, uh, you know, on an infrastructure budget of around about 10 to $15,000. Now, I, I would challenge any uh, post-secondary institution uh, to provision uh, their full technology infrastructure uh, for under you know fifteen thousand dollars, so it is it is in fact doable. Um, where we are planning to work is where we are most likely to get the most traction in moving this agenda forward. Um, you know, speaking candidly, and I think uh, you know some of this would be reflected in your experiences with the, the Open ETC, Clint. It is very hard for an individual educator within an organ within an organization uh, working uh, against uh, working with a whole range of proprietary software tools that is uh, provided by the organization to step out and say, "Hey, I would like to use this uh, FOSS tool, uh, you know, for my OER work or my OER initiative." And I think that in part has been the success of the Open ETC because you do provide that avenue for a faculty member to actually make use of a FOSS tool to be able to do this. And so I think it's important for us to be able to provide those uh, capabilities uh, to those who may not have them. And in working in the context of the, 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 the Pacific, uh, you know, more than half of the Pacific have a population of under half a million people. And you can appreciate the challenges. I mean, you run a system or work for an institution that functions system wide. Um, the, the challenges of, or the fiscal challenges of provisioning infrastructure, you know, you've only got a population of, you know, half a million people. Uh, your choices are very limited in terms of what you can provide. And so I believe we are going to get traction from um, these governments because we'll have the evidence to show them. And, and, and this is why Annie's work is so, so important because it shows that this is in fact possible. And um, we will bring the ministries together and the, the relative decision makers, um, you know, to move this forward. And I realize I've, you know, sort of tact tactfully avoided the essence of your question around, you know, the uh, the parallels between, you know, sort of OER and uh, open source, which there are many, uh, but there are also, there has been considerable deviation uh, from those uh, original principles. Um, and, you know, while many folk or, you know, talk about, you know, the, the OER movement uh, as this, you know, unified thing. Um, it's not. 
Um, there, there are many different perspectives, and I think that's healthy for an ecosystem. Uh, having multiple perspectives is a good thing. And even within, um, and, and, and you will also be very familiar with this, Clint, I mean, there's also a healthy dynamic around the founding principles between Libre software and the, the more pragmatic, uh, you know, open source software, um, you know, folk. And, you know, it's, it's a healthy ecosystem because there are different views and perspectives. Um, the work that we are doing is, is strongly uh, founded in the principles of Libre. Um, and that's kind of the, the piece of the puzzle we are trying to solve uh, in, in terms of moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you, a lot of what you're saying resonates with me for sure. Um, I, there's a couple of questions around um, um, supports at institutions. As you as you mentioned, many of us work within institutions to provide um, services, and sometimes there's no choice for faculty members about what technologies they want to use. Uh, you know, the institution is is kind of mandated to use technologies, and uh, and Brian brings up a point there. Uh, how can those of us who need to work with institutional IT, which are increasingly hostile to open source or anything self-hosted, uh, ease those concerns to get things going? My short response, Brian, is to carry on doing what you're doing. Uh, I, I think you're getting, uh, you know, remarkable traction. I mean, one of the reasons I'm not sitting in the academy uh, is that you know, are, are related to those very challenges, uh, that it is so, so hard um, to get the decision makers to provide uh, better support uh, for this work. And so I think kind of this parallel learning universe model uh, is a way of, you know, moving forward in small steps. Um, and you know, just continue plugging at what you're doing with the open ETC. And we, we're certainly going to be taking a very, very close look at, uh, you know, what your challenges are. Um, and I understand from some limited conversations I've had with members of your team, uh, scalability is a big one. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, how to deal, how to deal with that. And I'm hopeful if, if we can, at least within the Pacific region, um, start developing a cadre of uh, CIS admins who, as part of the official ministry work, are also provisioning support for the community garden, we may be able to make some progress. Um, and within the region, the, you know, there are nat these natural incentives because A, these, these governments don't have the money to be providing the kind of infrastructure that we typically see at a big university. And, 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 and so this uh, is, is, is really going to be the only way in which a folk can move forward, not to mention all the real challenges we are facing now around digital sovereignty uh, of, of, of nation's data. Um, and I have some very deep concerns around the generative AI work. Um, not so much from, you know, uh, critiquing the technology. Uh, I'm very concerned as how it's going to exclude uh, the developing world because the developing world will just not be able to pay the subscription uh, rates that uh, will be required to you know, make use of these these you know, these impressive tools. So you know, we we have some challenges ahead, but we're going to continue, um, you know, working and um, making things happen. <laughs> Really had kind of built on that uh, the question of Brian's as well about um, open science and the open science movement. There might be some lessons that we could learn there where they focus on not only the data and the outputs, but also the code and the infrastructure to ensure there is like a replicate that these yep. these findings are replicable. And that might be a model for top down messaging that unis can use to refocus on FOSS alongside OER. Yeah. And it's a absolutely. And, and it seems to me Europe is doing a much better job of getting this right than other parts of the world. Uh, and you see that in teaching and, and learning as well. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I, 
Yeah. Oh no, I'm, I'm just. I'm, you, you will see a far greater uh, commitment and uh, and support for FOSS in Europe um, and and you know these areas, and you would see it in your, the Perio Foundation um, because a, a, a good chunk of your support is coming from you know is coming from Europe. So the Europeans are getting it right. Um, we could try, maybe try and figure out how you know why why they're getting it right. I was going to say you're seeing a similar trend with like teaching and learning technologies too, where it's not just about uh, it, it, it's about uh, platforms that will um, deliver content, but it's not just content that uh, even an educator can develop themselves. There's a very very close relationship between the content and the platform, and sometimes I think you know having worked in the open education uh, ecosystem for a while now that that sometimes the open eco the open education uh, ecosystem people kind of forget that relationship and are, are you know I think specifically around things like uh, homework systems or adaptive learning platforms and stuff where it's you can't decouple the content from the platform but for many years the open education uh, community has been focused on resources and not so much the the platforms and so i think there there is an argument to be made there that the platforms are uh, much more important than the content the two are definitely intertwined yeah, very much so. I was, I, was, I was just having a look. I see most folk have joined as listen only because I was keen to, if if folk did have access to to a microphone, I'm not sure if the big blue button session has been set up in this way, but I'd be very keen to hear you know, if any advice uh, from colleagues who've been working in this space a long time um, for you know the success of the fossil initiative. Um, you know, what, what are the traps that we should be avoiding? Um, you know, it's still very early days and we're still thinking through a lot of this stuff. I mean, one of the things I, I'm hoping to be able to achieve is, and, and, and it's in part one of the reasons why you will not see much content on the Fostal website, uh, because I, I, I believe the initiative like this sh should be uh, developed uh, on, you know, based on the principles of sociocracy. Um, and that the circles and the communities are the folk that actually determine the direction and how this thing is set up. And so I'm hoping to be able to achieve the critical mass of, of countries um, that will take a step uh, or a first step that would then actually inform the development of this thing, uh, you know, uh, based on the principles of sociocracy. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting ride. Um, if we get it right, it's going to be quite significant uh, for this part of the world. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to make a, a fair number of mistakes along the way. And um, I mean, I'm shifting the emphasis is because I'm actually wanting to have governments fund this as opposed to individual institutions or donors uh, to, you know, to step away from those, uh, you know, awkward reliances. Uh, in you know achieving success yeah i'm just going to invite anybody who has a question that would like to ask either on camera or on microphone if you want to turn your microphone on and uh and pop on to ask wayne a question i'll just pause and let you do that or advice we we need a lot of it or advice <laughs> yeah i do see a question from allison uh in or a comment from Allison in the chat here. Uh, I am in Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. We have our own data center and self-host many of our systems and websites. However, we don't get a lot of say in the software we implement. Our move from Sakai to Brightspace was chosen by a faculty committee. I, that must be very frustrating. I, I acknowledge the frustration that that can cause. Um, we don't have that challenge. <laughs> we only host the free and open source software tools that we choose. And the ones we find that aren't uh, that productive, uh, we replace with others. Um, but I should also say we have significantly less funding than you have to do this. <laughs> uh, OER can be. <laughs> 
and has been successfully framed in terms of access and equity along with cost benefit to students. It seems we need better ways to reframe FOSS as more than free as in dollars in higher ed amongst the IT departments and government funders. Maybe there's a FUD agreement for starters with surveillance and privacy issues of the big for-profit platforms becoming increasingly known. Yeah. I, Irwin, I agree. Uh, our, our messaging has to, has to improve, and um, and I mean, I think the surveillance cap, the challenges around surveillance capitalism, and you know, data sovereignty, privacy, are powerful levers. Uh, in addition to that, I you know, I've been thinking that the whole sustainability uh, angle is an important one because. It, at least as a you know sustainability as a concept people know that the planet's in crisis um and maybe to find those parallels of how we message you know demonstrating that the the fast solution is is the more sustainable solution uh and hopefully better for the planet yeah great um I think we'll uh, we'll wrap this up here, Wayne. I just want to thank you once again for joining us today and giving us some some provocations and some things to think about and telling us about the projects that you have been working on. Uh, and uh, I look forward to connecting with you about Fostel and talking more about that. Uh, I know when wearing some of my other hats, uh, I'm very interested in the work that you're doing and always have been. I mean, the work that you and Dave Lane, who I know is on here as well, in terms of uh, really uh, supporting and coming up with unique models to ensure that uh, we're supporting and using open source software are, are models that we have looked at as well in British Columbia with some of the projects that we have on. It's very impressive work and uh, I'm really happy you were able to come here today and talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Also, just before, I'm not sure if this has been shared before because I haven't been monitoring the chat that closely, but I just want to point you to the tech.oeru.org uh, blog blog site that Dave maintains, and and there you'll find full descriptions of you know all the tech that we run, but not only that, a, a, a number of recipes for uh, installing the apps uh, that we we utilize, uh, which we share you know share freely, and in part that will be a significant input to the fossil initiative. Uh, in you know pro uh, pro providing the recipes for the sys admins across the Pacific to you know start implementing some of these technologies uh, themselves, uh, but with, within the community garden context. So just a big shout out to Dave. Uh, very little of what I do would be possible uh, without the phenomenal work that uh, Dave does and heavy lifting in, in keeping this infrastructure together. Yeah, so shout out to Dave there. <laughs>